Hello. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. I'm about to tell you about a little-known dark part of Canadian history involving vile crimes committed against many people, including children, as well as a massive government cover-up. Spanning over two decades, this story involves the drugging, torture, abuse, and murder, as well as trafficking and selling of thousands of children, spanning over two decades. With the perpetrators of these crimes being the Catholic Church, government officials, high-ranking doctors, and even the CIA. And while this may sound like a crazy conspiracy theory, everything I'm about to share with you comes directly from government documents, newspaper archives, court records, and many witness accounts. Let's begin at the beginning of World War II. This man, Maurice Duplessis, is the governor of Quebec, Canada, a controversial figure who marks a period of political history that would later be known as the Great Darkness. Duplessis, a childless bachelor and devout Catholic, declared Quebec to be a Catholic province and actively promoted the church's welfare. He put schools, orphanages, and hospitals in the hands of religious orders with no government oversight. At this time, in Quebec, sexual education and contraceptives were illegal. Not only did unwed mothers not qualify for social assistance, Having a child out of wedlock was so taboo that these mothers went to great lengths to keep their pregnancies a secret. Many felt coerced or even forced by the church or social workers into surrendering their babies to be put up for adoption. By the 1940s, 87% of the residents in Quebec's overflowing orphanages still had one or both parents. Hervé Bertrand tells his story as one of these orphans. My story is one of the many orphans, the children who were abused, the children who were born out of wedlock like me. I was born in 1943. Two days after, I was transferred to a nursery. In the nursery, there were three persons for 25 babies on average. Sunday was a day when children would get ready. They would be taught to be presentable and well-groomed, so they would take us to the room where they received children. They would choose the most beautiful children. I was not adopted, but there were children who were. I had a friend who got adopted by Jewish people from Austria. It is a deep, dark secret from Quebec's past. Young, unmarried women pregnant and nowhere to turn. Some have found a solution in Montreal's Jewish community. At this time, the United States now homed up to 4 million Jews, with many couples looking to adopt. However, there was a law in place at this time forbidding interfaith adoptions, which greatly limited the availability of adoptable babies to Jewish couples. Local maternity homes, doctors, lawyers, and members within the Jewish and Catholic communities saw these babies as a business opportunity and started a network to internationally traffic and sell the babies on the black market. Authorities believed that at least a dozen baby mills operated in the Montreal area. Representatives of the baby market ring and maternity homes approached expectant mothers several months before the babies were due paying them up to $40 for their babies, or in many cases, nothing at all, only to turn around and sell these babies on the black market for up to $10,000, or roughly equivalent to $100,000 today. When do you expect your baby? In about three months. Does anybody know? Well, maybe we can help you. Let me tell you about this place. Babies were taken away while the mothers were still in the final stages of delivery. This was known as the clean break protocol. Eye contact between mother and baby was often prevented by using sheets, pillows, or other means. Some mothers reported screaming and trying to run after their babies only to be physically restrained. Even worse, there are witness stories of mothers giving birth in these Catholic hospitals and being told that their baby had died only to find out years later that their baby had been given up for adoption. 
Since the nuns were in charge of most maternity wards and Quebec's birth registry was run by these religious authorities, it was simple to change the baby's name and religion to that of the new adoptive parents. And because of what nuns in the church represented, nobody asked any questions. 30, 40 nuns in their dignified uniforms would board trains at the central station in Montreal, with infant babies in their arms. In many cases, the Jewish families didn't even have to cross the border. The babies were trafficked directly to their doorstep. I was born in Montreal on May 31st, 1947. I was adopted by a Jewish family living in Hamilton, Ontario. I was adopted by parents in Edmonton, Alberta, who paid $10,000 for me. I believe that it could have been an illegal adoption. My adoptive parents are, lived in Detroit. They're Jewish and they raised me Jewish. I was adopted by an Orthodox Jewish family and my father paid $15,000 for me. According to a former guard at the Sisters of Mercy Hospital who took home hundreds of discarded documents detailing this corruption, the Sisters of Mercy alone made over $5 million from this business, selling 50,000 babies. Legal prosecution was difficult because of the differences in criminal statutes. The church, doctors, lawyers, social workers, rabbis, and many others were complicit in this ring. The scandal faded out in the mid-1950s, with only one or two people sitting in jail for a few months, and only one Montreal lawyer was disbarred. After the scandal died down, the baby selling continued, albeit more cautiously. Today, with easily accessible commercial DNA tests, many of these adoptees are finding out that they're actually French-Canadian. There are entire Facebook groups for the victims of the Grey and the Black Market baby scandal. Now, I was able to speak to one of these adoptees named Joanne, who told me their adoption story of being trafficked through the Grey baby market. Unlike the illegal Black Market, this was something that was legally ambiguous at the time. I was born in Montreal, Canada on January 18, 1957. My, my adoptive mother became uh, very ill and had her uterus taken out. And they tried to go to, uh, to social services, which they did, but they were turned down. They then went back to the doctor that had, that had goofed up the operation. And he said, well, he could try and help them since they were turned down by the social services and try to go the other way around, which is what we call the gray baby market. Um, and that's done between two doctors and a lawyer. That's where my mom came in and that's where I came in. And yeah, they arranged, they arranged the adoption. It's estimated that out of the 300,000 orphans in Quebec in this time period, 200,000 were adopted or sold. I do believe that it was a money-making machine. It's child trafficking. Um, it's unwed women like my mom uh, that have to give up the children. They don't have a choice. Um, that was the only possibility to even survive. Then the children get sold. It was legal because the lawyer said it was legal. <laughs> Not saying that it was legal. They decided it was legal, right? I mean, when when you when you take children from unwilling moms because that's what society says and you pay for a child, whatever amount it is, then it's child trafficking in my world. Joanne was one of only three siblings that were put up for adoption by her mother. And while she was eventually able to reconnect with her older biological sister and biological mother, records for her oldest brother don't exist, which means he was likely sold on the black market or became a Duplissy orphan. I've laid it to rest and hopefully one day I will either find out one way or the other what he was, who he is, where he is, if he is. 
it's it's it makes one angry inside and it uh, it hurts a lot i i told my mom that i would try and find her firstborn but i can't and i probably never will unless he takes his dna as well More and more people are coming forward in Quebec, claiming they were abused as children while they were wards of the government. They're known as Duplessis orphans, and they were institutionalized in the 1940s and 50s. The war had ended and the baby boom had begun, filling up the orphanages with children. The federal government decided to withdraw most of its funding for public education, but was still actively funding health care meaning that these orphanages would receive the funding of 70 cents per orphan per day, whereas hospitals with children labeled as mentally ill or incompetent would get $2.25 per child per day. So in order to get more federal funding, the Quebec government advised the Catholic institutions to change the facility's vocation to asylum in order to benefit from the federal funding. Catholic religious groups received $70 million in subsidies by claiming that the orphans were mentally ill. And overnight, many of these schools transformed into psychiatric hospitals or these children were shipped away. From one day to the next, the rooms became cells, the windows had bars, the books were thrown into the trash. And medical records were falsified, giving the orphans false medical diagnosis without any assessments. Now that these children held labels, they no longer required education and could be used as slave labor. The state had stopped funding. Around March 18, 1954, the genocide began. The children were sent to a slaughterhouse. After this, children were labeled mentally handicapped. Every room was equipped with locked doors. Every room had cells. And if the children were not obedient, there was a straitjacket in each cell. I felt more lonely than ever. I was scared and wondering what would happen to us. Then every child had to work. Instead of going to school, children would work to help the hospital. It was slave work that saved money in Quebec. With no education, personalized attention, or love, it hindered the children's normal development. A number of orphan survivors also claimed to have suffered physical abuse. Common allegations included years of reoccurrent beatings, slappings, ice bath, being tied to the bed springs, unjustified solitary confinement to a cell, sometimes for months or even years, and subjection to physical restraints, including straitjackets and being collared like dogs. The detailed allegations of sexual abuse and sodomy from the guards and members of the church in these institutions are horrific. The group is growing rapidly. More people are coming forward, and each one has a horror story of physical or sexual abuse at the hands of the religious orders which ran the institutions or the people who worked there. In the summer, we would go to the woods. We would go fishing, make small hooks ourselves, and use an old rope. It's all we had to fish. Every mentor who took us there would call over a boy, and he would sexually abuse him. Once it was my turn, he said, Bertrand, come here. The mentors had to release their urges, and they picked on children. There were even beauty contests in Mount Providence among the mentors. They would say, we will choose the most beautiful, this one. It was a real contest of child rape. Even a priest would do it. Hervé was sodomized by a guard at the age of 12, and after that, he was beaten and raped at least 10 more times. He was 14 when an employee of the orphanage sexually assaulted him so violently that he had to be hospitalized for a month. Starting in 1992, Bertrand reported these brutal pedophile attacks to the Montreal police. He made criminal depositions several times to the High Court of Montreal, although the general prosecutor of Quebec has never followed through on these depositions. And unfortunately, it gets much worse. Since these children were now falsely labeled as psychiatric patients, they became victims of brutal medical experiments, including electroshock, mass druggings, and lobotomies. One orphan claims that he was given medicine and was told that it was candy. 
One of the head doctors at St. Jean de Dieu is Dr. Denny Lazar, who would later go on to be a government official. He admits in his own biography to being one of the many doctors that participated in doing psychiatric experiments on the orphans in the 1950s, stating that he and his colleagues would start the morning by pushing the button on the electric box that would put a dozen or more orphans in an epileptic coma. Then they would go to the insulin room and they would inject a dozen or more with insulin and put them in a coma. After a few hours, they would go back and inject them with glucose. Some would wake up and Leisure states that they would get a surprise that some did not wake up. One Duplessis orphan named Louise recounts a day when she noticed a young girl leaving the operating room with two holes in the neck. The hospital personnel immediately placed a straitjacket on this adolescent and threw her in a cell. The only visit she received in the intervening weeks was from employees who noted that she was dead. They drugged me till I was a frozen zombie, he says, then they cut up my brain. The scars on his forehead and scalp from lobotomies done when he was 17 and 19. Done without my consent, says saint -Aucoin. There were 20,000 orphans over three decades, 7,000 were confined to the psychiatric wing. 5% of them were given lobotomies. They used the orphans as guinea pigs because they, they didn't have no one else to do any experiments. Most orphans survived their experience, but many died at the institution. Now deceased Duplessis orphan Sylvia Day was tasked with collecting bodies of orphans who died from these medical experiments and to transport the bodies to the morgue situated in the cellar of the hospital, wash the bodies and store them in the freezer. Children were also victims of operations during which vital organs such as hearts, lungs, kidneys, and livers were cut out, put into refrigerated vehicles, and sold in the United States. Silvio stated that over the course of three months, he had transferred about 75 orphan bodies to the morgue, where many of the bodies were sold to local medical colleges. Silvio Albert Day was an orphan at a psychiatric hospital named St. Jean de Dieu. He was assigned to the morgue and recounted some of the horrors he witnessed. Là, puis, quand c'est qu'il s'est couché, qu'il n'y a rien. C'est comme un avavo plat, tu sais. Puis, en fait, quand j'ai enlevé la copine, là, je voyais, ils étaient là. C'était main pas collé, c'était décollé. Là, j'ai vu qu'il n'y avait plus de cerveau. Je voyais le creux. We don't know how many cadavers were sold because the hospital registries have mysteriously disappeared from government archives, but it's believed that each hospital has their own cemetery, one of which is known as the Pigsty Cemetery since it was right next to a church-owned pig farm and slaughterhouse. It's been claimed that the animal carcasses were thrown into the same hole with the children, who did not receive any kind of decent burial. Thousands of kids who died from medical experiments were buried in cardboard boxes or just piled on top of one another, while other orphans were allegedly burned in the hospital incinerator with the garbage, discarded in death like they were in life, and all without police inquest. The Sisters of Providence allegedly exhumed and moved all of the bodies to another cemetery before they sold their plots of land in 1974 to a Quebec-run liquor board called SAQ for the sum of $4.9 million. The sales certificate, which does not mention the former cemetery, releases the Sisters from all guarantee or responsibility concerning the state, the composition, and the degree of compaction of the soil and subsoil. In the hospital archives, the cemetery records are empty. According to workers, they only moved a very small portion of the over 2,000 bodies, including those of many children buried that still remain under this SAQ government warehouse to this day. In 1999, while building a new parking lot, workers discovered bone fragments, which SAQ claimed were those of animal bones, even though no analysis or report was ever done. Yet multiple workers claim that they saw what looked like human femurs, tibias, kneecaps, hip bones, and sacrums. 
Today, the Duplessis orphan survivors are still fighting to have the bodies exhumed. Hospital records were poor, others were lost, so nobody knows exactly how many people were buried here or how many of them had been victims of medical experimentation. Exhuming the bodies and subsequent forensic testing might very well lead to conclusions that this kind or confirmation uh, that this kind of medical experimentation did in fact occur. So far, the Canadian government has refused these requests, likely due to how it would implicate them, since not only did they have full knowledge of these experiments, they were funding them. Although you may be asking why would any government be interested in this kind of psychological torture and experimentation? Immediately after the war, large political currents began to shift. Allies became enemies and enemies became allies. In the United States, the new Cold War against communism brought with it new fears. Both America and the Soviets knew that Germany had many superior technologies that had nearly won them the war. Due to the looming threat that the other country may gain a competitive edge, there was nothing more precious than the German scientists and the intelligence officers that headed the Nazi war machine. And thus began Operation Paperclip, a secret program in which nearly 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and doctors were taken from Germany to America, Canada, and Britain for government employment. This included convicted Nazi war criminals, some of which would eventually go on to hold the highest clearance at the Pentagon. These countries knew that Germany was only progressing in many aspects of medical science because of their experimentation on prisoners and in concentration camps. They were able to push medical science in a manner that cannot be pushed if you're experimenting on rabbits and guinea pigs. So in the name of national security, the same atrocities that these doctors were hung for after the Nuremberg trials now became justified in North America. They systematically violated the free will and mental dignity of their subjects, and like the Nazis, they chose to victimize special groups of people whose existence they considered out of prejudice and convenience less worthy than their own. In fact, both Duplessis orphans and MK Ultra victims identified Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele, also known in Auschwitz as Dr. Death, as carrying out experiments on them in Montreal. And while it's unconfirmed if Joseph Mengele was actually in Canada during this time period, it was revealed that in 1962, Mengele, using an alias, applied for a visa to Canada. Although whether or not he made it there, or had been there before, is unknown. However, some believe that these photos from a Montreal psychiatric hospital are of the Nazi doctor. Mengele would have been at the Saint-Jean-de-Dieu uh, hospital. He was seen there. Other German doctors confirmed to be involved in Montreal experiments included Dr. Franz Joseph Kalman and Dr. Heinz Lehmann. Both of Jewish descent arrived in North America right before World War II began. Kalman had been a protege of one of the architects of racial hygiene policies in Nazi Germany, and Lehmann brought with him a German tranquilizer called chlorpromazine, which would be tested on the orphans and would act like a chemical lobotomy. These druggings had long-term detrimental effects and in some cases even caused death. Yet Lehman was able to practice psychiatry for 26 years without a license. Because at the time, if you wanted to practice psychiatry in Montreal, all you had to do was go meet with Scottish-born Dr. Ewan Cameron, and he would write out temporary papers at this building called Ravenscrag, now known as the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal. Dr. Ewan Cameron was at the top of the psychiatric food chain. Throughout his life, he was the president of the American, Canadian, and even World Psychiatric Association. A few moments ago, Dr. Ewan Cameron of Montreal, chairman of the organizing committee, opened this Third World Congress of Psychiatry with these words. These are the days and hours are the occasions that summon up determination, fire of the imagination, and drive us forward in this greatest of endeavors. Cameron and Lehman received many awards for their horrifying experiments. They also appeared to have been operating a eugenics program out of Montreal and McGill University, all while receiving funding from the Canadian military, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the OSS, that would later become the CIA. 
By far, the most chilling experiments we have uncovered took place at this Gothic estate called Raven's Crag, halfway up Mount Royal in Montreal. It houses the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry of McGill University. It was here that the CIA funded a series of experiments, severe experiments. The work was done by the Institute's then director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. It is the closest experimentation to brainwashing yet disclosed. In 1951, Alan Dulles was appointed the head of the CIA, and shortly after, he began the battle for the minds of men to counter so-called Soviet brainwashing by dabbling in secret mind control operations. Americans, they have too many freedoms. That is another thing you must remember, comrade. For one day, it will be your mission to destroy those bourgeois capitalist freedoms. One of the goals was to erase selective memories so that those taken prisoner would not be able to divulge any confidential information to the enemy. Sometimes, in spite of everything a man can do, he falls into the hands of the enemy. If you were an airman whose plane was shot down in enemy territory, or a soldier, or a marine captured in combat on the enemy lines, your first feeling might be one of helplessness, as if suddenly the whole world had dropped out from under you, leaving you at the enemy's mercy. Such a feeling is quite understandable for a minute or two. However, the more important goal to the CIA was to weaponize mind control techniques against captured Soviets. First came Project Bluebird, which utilized the polygraph, drugs, and hypnotism for the purposes of interrogation. This then evolved into Project Artichoke, which was created to determine whether a person could be involuntarily made to perform an act of attempted assassination, like the movie The Manchurian Candidate. Shoot Bobby Raymond through the forest. Yes, ma'am. Then, a clandestine meeting at the Ritz-Carlton in Montreal took place, with members of the Canadian, British, and American intelligence agencies, as well as a McGill University scientist and psychiatrist, Dr. Donald Hebb. This is when the CIA launched one of their most notorious secret research projects, MKUltra, in which they would invest in the development of techniques and drugs for the purpose of total mind control. They were particularly interested in Dr. Cameron after he published a study claiming that he could wipe a person's memories. The MKUltra program cost $25 million and involved hundreds of experiments on human subjects at 80 different institutions, including in Montreal, headed by Dr. Cameron, which would be known as Subproject 68. Among the victims of this new breed of experimentation were prisoners, military soldiers, civilians, hospital patients, and even children, including Duplissy orphans. Since their medical records were already falsified, and because they had no family to ask questions, they were the perfect victims. The patients did not consent to the treatment and were never told that they were being used for research including Anne Diamond, who believes that her, her twin brother, and her father, who was an intelligence officer, may have all been victims of Dr. Cameron. I and my brother, uh, Donald, were put in an LSD experiment at uh, McGill University at the Allen Memorial, connected to the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal. And Dr. Cameron was running that experiment. Anne believes that on her and her twin's fifth birthday, Dr. Cameron wrote a check to Anne's father for $3,000 as compensation for their involvement in these experiments. Later, I went down to Washington and found that got the file for Project 68 and was going through it, and sure enough, I found Cameron's financial record. Um, and I've been told this happened on my when I was five. So. In the financial records, there were all these little expenses that are very meticulously written out by Dr. Cameron in columns, you know, and on my birthday, April 11, 1956, he wrote a check for $3,000. Pretty, didn't have my name on the column, but it's close enough for me, that was the bomb. In his financial records for, in August 1956, he writes, he bought, he went out and bought Punch, for a party. He wrote children's party supplies, punch, uh, plastic cups, 
and a bottle of ether for a children's party. I think the real interest was in the children. That's my particular bias because those children were valuable. And what have you got after left when you've just destroyed a 40 year old, you know, father of three or something and send him home? You got nothing. You know, you've got a guy who's never going to be able. I mean, that's what happened. They sent these people home, unable to function for the rest of their lives. And, you know, but if you could get hold of that guy's kids, you know, and program them, then when they could be useful, they were looking for people they could use, you know. This is the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry. It's part of McGill University. Some people call the Allen a rest home. And in a way, I suppose it is. Others, shall we say the uninformed, call it, well, many things. The psychiatric experiments conducted at McGill University at this time were strange, including keeping schizophrenic patients bathed in red light for months at a time, or sensory deprivation to the point of driving most subjects insane. We wonder how human beings would react in situations where there was a near absence of things happening. What happened to him? Well, in a way, nothing. Looks to me like he's been in an accident. No, this is an experiment that took place at McGill University. Students volunteered to participate in this study of human behavior under extreme and prolonged monotony. Yet, it was impossible for most of these students to take it for more than 24 or 48 hours. The psychologist D.O. Hebb and his associates, who conducted these experiments, found that deprived of ordinary, everyday sensory experiences, the subjects began to lose touch with reality. The sensory deprivation experiment was noted to cause the subject's identity to disintegrate, and many began to hallucinate within just 48 hours. They also found that by putting a person into this state, it made them highly suggestible with long-term lasting effects, making it the perfect foundation for brainwashing. Cameron added on to just sensory deprivation, with the combination of intensive electroshock, barbiturate-induced comas, and megadoses of hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. This combination left patients dazed and confused, incontinent, and often in a state of utter panic, increasing the intensity until there was a complete personality breakdown and they were empty shells, in some cases to that of a newborn baby. This was referred to by Cameron as depatterning. Once the person's identity was gone, Cameron would attempt to replace it with a technique he termed psychic driving by forcing the unwitting subject to listen to looped recorded messages on repeat for days, weeks, or months. It was reportedly common for these recorded messages to be broadcast from speakers in the wall or from under a pillow. Most of this would take place in what was referred to as the sleep room. Here's a sample of an actual recording that one of Cameron's patients was forced to listen to on repeat. You can get along if you are not afraid of others and you are very pleased to be with them. In your relationship with people, you are an adult to accept the responsibility of a wife and a mother. In your relationship with you people, can get you can get along with you are not a Ironically, Cameron was selected to diagnose Nazi figure Rudolf Hess during the Nuremberg trials, a man who claimed to have lost all of his memories. Cameron diagnosed him with amnesia and hysteria, and although Hess later admitted to faking amnesia, it's impossible to know if that confession was influenced by Cameron or what the real truth is. And when he over, went over to Nuremberg in 45, I mean, and, and helped to brainwash Rudolf Hess, you know, with his colleague, Dr. Nolan Lewis, they managed to make Hess completely forget all his colleagues in the SS so that when they greeted him in the, in the courtroom, he didn't know who they were. Well, you know, that's in 45. Well, they were doing it way before that. You know, we heard he was, like, they, they examined him and they determined he was capable of standing trial. But in fact, there was much, there were more stories that he actually, they wiped his memory. He didn't know what he'd done. After this time, the Nuremberg Code was created in order to prevent future medical atrocities from occurring. 
Yet Cameron's work was clearly in violation of this code, which states that voluntary human consent is essential. It's likely that Cameron's ambition caused him to forget about the basic oath that he swore as a doctor to do no harm. However, his work did not exist in a vacuum. He stood on the shoulders of the work that came before him and was among countless doctors and government officials that were all likely fully aware and involved in the program of experimenting on unconsenting subjects. Many key players were given immunity after Cameron's untimely and mysterious death in 1967 after hiking in the mountains. He was then used as a scapegoat for the entire MKUltra project. In 1973, the CIA's MKUltra files were ordered to be destroyed. However, due to a clerical error, seven boxes of financial records survived the purge and they were accessed from a Freedom of Information request. Because of this, we'll never know how far MKUltra really went as most victims struggled to recount what they had endured as the experimentation, by design, often resulted in permanent memory loss, among other damages that still affect the victims to this day. At, at age 11, actually, my dad suddenly was put in the Allen Memorial. He just was taken from work. He was not a mental patient. She was not someone with a psychiatric history. And they just took him from work and they put him in the Allen. And he stayed there for six weeks. When he came home to our family in January of 1963, he didn't remember us. Uh, he didn't kind of looked at us strangely as if, well, mm, I sort of know who you are, but who are you? In the history of the MKUltra program, they started with who was available to experiment on. Well, after the war, it was soldiers, like my father. All that was in my father's file in 2007, when I did get a copy, there was one a page, which was a photocopy of a file card that typed out, said Cameron, his name and Cameron patient. So I think, yeah, what that just indicates is there was a period of time where they were labeling, making file cards, notify, who are the Cameron patients, Here are the, here's the card file, you know, and then eventually we will empty these files and make sure that, you know, the contents never get in the hands of a, a relative or a lawyer. In the process of my research, I reached out via email and phone to dozens of government officials for statements about these atrocities, yet I received very little to no helpful responses. And to this day, the Catholic Church admits to no wrongdoing. Roman Catholic Church officials in Quebec say they will not apologize to a group known as the Duplessis Orphans. The orphans allege they were mistreated as wards of the church several decades ago. The province's assembly of bishops says the church was not responsible for the abuse and therefore it does not owe an apology. And while the Catholic Church and government bodies say that the orphans' claims were unfounded, Several different court documents all include similar accounts of abuse, including isolation, druggings, sleep deprivation, and repeated sexual abuse. Hervé has still not received true justice for what he went through. Joanne has still not been able to track down her older brother, whose existence has no record. I think it's, again, I think it's evil, and I think it's sad, and I think it's it's many things in one bag. I don't think people understand many of us that are adopted and have traveled this journey just to find out who we are and, and to seek a dead end, for example, with my brother. But the problem is that if they open up, if they open completely up in Quebec, there's a lot of documents that will not be found because when it's a black baby market, they were either destroyed or there were no papers from the beginning. So that's one of the problems. But I think they should stand up and own it, what, what has gone on. And, and when I say they, I mean the politicians. And I don't care if it's, if it, if these politicians that were at the time already gone, it's it's still the government that knows about what went on. Anne is still trying to piece together what happened to her and her father when she was a child. Right, well, you know, if they can wipe your memory with a drug or with electroshock, and if they can keep you asleep for a month, you know, and if your family is not, you know, most much of the time they're not even allowed to see you, I mean, 
and, or if you don't have family because you're you're just kind of the kind of person they liked a bit of an outsider a bit of someone who, an orphan an adopted child who's not loved you know or that sort of person they looked for and they can easily find those people and then and what, what's your frame of reference then for knowing what's happened to you when you wake up dazed out of a, a an insulin coma you know so consent you might consent i mean from what i've heard from people they gave consent to 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 have their wrist wrist operated on or or fixed or broken or and and then they woke up a month later and they'd been you know <laughs> they'd been experimented on and they didn't know what had happened they found out later you find out years later if you can get the records and while after legal battles, there has been some compensation to the victims of the MK Ultra experiments and even to the Duplicy orphans, it can never make up for the decades of kidnapping, torture, sexual abuse, scientific experimentation, and murder that took place in many facilities in Canada that have largely been covered up to this day. And had I not personally seen the medical records of a Duplicy orphan myself during a medical practicum when I was a college student, I would never have known that this had even happened. And since many of their survivors' numbers are dwindling due to old age, I wanted to share the story of their forgotten, the story of the Great Darkness. Thank you so much for watching. This video took weeks and weeks to create, so if you enjoyed this content, you can like and subscribe. And there are links in the description if you'd like to support me through Patreon, Subscribestar, or a one-time donation through PayPal. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Meow.